Hi everybody, today I talk with Braden Snell, someone who turned his love for programming in high school into a formal pursuit in college, spent many years working as a software developer before embarking on the great entrepreneurial journey where he created Zilch, a fantastic learning resource that helps people learn programming in a really fun and playful way. In this chat, we talk a lot about how to pivot from a passion project to building a sustainable business, how to identify whether your business is on the right track, how to stretch and become a generalist capable of handling all aspects of building and marketing a product, something which many solo entrepreneurs get very familiar with, and a whole lot more. It's going to be a fun one, so stick around. All right, Braden, great to chat with you. And so introduce yourself to every one of us here. Yeah, I'm uh, Braden. I'm, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, and have been... Uh, building uh, software since I was a teenager. And I tell people it's like uh, Legos, but for bigger kids. Um, it's just, uh, it's always been a passion of mine to, to build things. And I've always had a ton of fun with it. And now I'm trying to build um, my own thing. It's, it's called Zilch. It's a way to help people level up their coding skills um, uh, through, through games. So I'm sure we'll dive more into that later, but. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like that's actually really fascinating. And I want to go really into it, both like what you're doing with Zilch and also a really cool logo has like a nice pixel font and like all that to it, which is like automatically the easiest way to like get me to be like excited about whatever you're building. But before we get to all of that though, right? So how do you get started with computers? So um, <clears throat> I had this class in middle school. It was an animation class with Flash for anybody who remembers Flash from from back in the day. And um, I loved it. I, I took this course multiple times, um, <laughs> um, you know, as, as like, a, you know, as a student twice and then as a TA, I just loved it. And um, the, the teacher showed us some things about um, like, hey, you can, you know, create this. I think they were called movie clips or something um, on the screen. And then it gives you this little reference here that you can type some stuff in this, in this place that pops up from the bottom and you can make these buttons to navigate around your animation to like start it over again. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I got more and more into it. I ended up um, starting to make, you know, just little small flash games, like little brick breaker games. You know, there's like a little paddle going around the bottom and it, hits the bricks, but I didn't know uh, anything about programming. I didn't really have any, uh, you know, super, you know, formal instruction. So I was doing this. I didn't even know like what loops were. So I remember um, uh, paying one of my friends, this is just, you know, little kids back back in, in middle school, paying him with like some uh, snacks that I had brought or something. I was like, hey, can you just take this like these three lines of, of code here and just copy paste this, but then just change this one thing every single time and do that, if, you know, a few hundred times so that I could get the ball to hit test all the um, blocks uh, on the screen. So it was this kind of really fun open-ended um, uh, process that um, I went through. And I ended up taking some computer science classes in, 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 in high school and, and realized, oh, this is like what it was all about. This is, this is, this is programming. So. Do you know what version of Flash you were learning from? I um, <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't uh, remember fully. I mean, I remember. I mean, it's because it's been so long ago. I remember when I started, it was Macromedia Flash, and then when I went a little bit, you know, further along, it turned into Adobe Flash. And I remember okay. like the you know differences, like oh, like Action Script two, and then now there's Action Script three, and um, I don't remember the details, but yeah. Yeah, I, I'm dating myself here, but it might have been like Flash MX 2004, might have been the Macromedia version you were using. And then it yeah. might have been CS1 or the first CS version, might have been the Adobe version of yeah. all of that. And that might have been the transition as well between Action Script 2 and 3. But, you know, I have like a water bottle that Macromedia sent me a long time ago that Nalgene uh, of like Macromedia Flash MX 2004, and I still have that with me. So one of the few things that I still like, carry around. I'm like, that was a, that's a fun little memento of a, of a fun era in programming and design and things like that. Yeah, no, totally. It was, it was a lot of fun. Was a lot and of so fun. in AP computer science, what was the programming language you were learning from? It was C++. Okay. C++. I know at some point they went, they were Java, then they went C++ and then, or, or was it the other way around? Was it C++ and then it went to Java or do you remember? 
Um, I know that my, um, you know, computer science that I did in, in high school was just uh, C plus plus. I remember going into, into college and, uh, starting off with like Java and then they switched the introductory courses from one thing to the other. And I remember it was like, I just ended up doing Java without ever doing C plus plus in college. Cause of like a switch that happened there. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, because you know, there was no Twitter back then. And so when tech drama like caught mainstream like attention, it was like big drama, you know, to actually have like people talk about it. There's this whole big like, you know, discussion about like, do we teach people object oriented programming very early on in their career? So they don't need to know about memory management and pointers and all these things. And then there's other campus like, no, why should they need to learn about this stuff? The future is going to be object oriented programming. Let's move them over to Java. And that was played out for most of us in the AP course, you know, selection where you had to choose between like, you know, what am I going to do here? And it's like C++, even though, you know, all the intro college exams and all that were Java based. So it's always like fun to see where people stood at the time on their ideas of where programming goes. I think now I think Python might be the one that they, I don't know, but I don't know about AP college exams anymore, but I do see a survey periodically about what intro college courses are thought in. And I think Python is by and far the, the leading winner here because it's very English friendly. And also it has applications beyond so many things like robotics and data, you know, data science and, and all that. So it's like, okay, it's a good gateway programming language to take you into all these other various areas. Yeah. And I, I mean, people do have strong opinions on this and, and, and maybe I'm one of them, but I think starting off with a language like Python or, you know, something like JavaScript, something where you can just get results out quick and get something that feels exciting quick is so important because uh, then that gives you the steam that you need to, you know, to keep going and, and to dive into other stuff that you're interested in. So I love the, I love the, 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 the languages that are, you know, just a, a little bit, a, little, a few less concepts that you need to, to get rolling with. Oh, no, I completely agree with you on that, you know, which is why I kind of end up like liking JavaScript a whole lot as well as and HTML, CSS and JavaScript, because you can go from like not knowing what you're doing to having like a hello world or your name turned on screen very, very quickly. So you're like, oh, wow, I can now take that and then slowly start expanding upon it, which I think in many ways was like the magic that Flash provided for so many of us back in the day. It's like you're drawing a square right now. Like, oh, okay, I drew something and it's running on my screen. Great. I, you know, I can do that with like an image editing tool. But wait, if I click on this now, it does other things. And that slowly gets you excited to kind of, you know, it's a little bit of gamification, but it also just gets you more comfortable with like exploring the unknown. It's kind of like, you know, you can jump into the deep end or we're going to have these stairs that take you one step at a time. So your fear slowly decreases with each subsequent step that you take. And I think that's what I think object programming and definitely Python and JavaScript and all these other more modern languages we see today are really helping with. And, you know, I think once you learn that, then you're more like, okay, now I want to learn the more advanced nitty gritty concepts because I am curious to know how these things go. I think your ability to retain that knowledge and explore it becomes so much better. And, you know, for most part though, I, my AP computer science class was C++. Hmm. And with, I remember using like Microsoft Visual C++ 6.0 or one of those things where I'm like, okay, just launch it, new file, play, it just works. And then they eventually moved to a newer version of C++ in the middle of the year where it was no longer create a project, type something in and play. And like, you had to create a project. I'm like, what is this project thing? Like, why, am, why are these other files in my, you know, my thing here? Like, I just want to add something to it. What's going on? And how do I link this new thing that I created with the old thing that I created, like in my class, like a couple of months ago, that was like a whole new world where I'm like, what is this whole build tools and that whole environment is absolutely, you know, complex to the point where I'm like, it's not even fun anymore. <laughs> and that's likely the web was much more straightforward. Just take notepad, type in some stuff, open your browser. Doesn't even have to have an HTML extension to it. It'll figure it out. And and that was a, a fun world to navigate from there. Yeah, it's uh yeah, sometimes the magic is 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 really cool, like the things that they do, but sometimes it is nice to just be able to start it really simple. So it's like, oh, like so it you know, it doesn't feel like so many uh, new concepts, but I love, I love like the web stuff in particular because it's so accessible because everybody has a web browser. I literally like, um, uh, like with my brother-in-law, um, when he was, uh, at first, uh, uh, getting into coding, 
it sit down in, in front of a web browser. And it's like, we don't even need to leave Chrome. Like we just open the dev tools and like create like a little snippet. It's just like write these few lines of code and boom, you can have a ball bouncing around on your screen. And like, that's like, that's powerful. Like to, just having that low barrier of entry and just immediately seeing something tangible and visual that gets you excited about learning. And with WebGL and WebAssembly, it almost comes full circle where some of your knowledge in C++ or C actually comes back to kind of enhance what you're actually seeing in your in your browser. So it's kind of like the web went a different path of like, we're going to go simple, we're going to do all these things that are very different. And then it kind of combined the best of the simplicity for most things you may be doing to more of the complex lower level capabilities so you can bypass all the abstraction and the performance bottlenecks and go straight to the GPU or the you know the hardware directly and do some really compelling things. Like you know, every time I see Figma and I'm just like blown away that all of Figma is entirely just a you know a web assembly web GPU based project. I know, yeah, Figma blows me away too. I just read, you know, some of their engineering blog posts and stuff and I'm like, wow, this is this is crazy. This is really cool. Yeah, I think they got Photoshop working in the browser now as well because the transpilation from like the legacy C or C++ into, you know, into Wasm was just like doable now. So it was like pretty, you know, performant in a browser environment, which is again, like something you would have, if you explained this to me like years ago, it would have been like not possible. And it's almost like what Flash was trying to do, which is like take more of these things, abstract away the details and have it run in your browser. That was scary for a lot of people at the time. But WebAssembly is almost this like backdoor way of getting to that world again, where it's like, yeah, you know, you're writing in a language that is different than what ultimately gets compiled into. But the output though is almost the app replacement. You know, it replaces apps in so many ways. Yeah. Have you um oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it now. It's not code sandbox, it's um another one. Oh, it's another one of those in browser ones, but they have they've literally taken Node.js and they've like compiled it down to WebAssembly. Oh, Stackblitz. Stackblitz, yes, yes, yeah. Stackblitz. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's really cool stuff that like you know folks folks are doing with some of this. Yeah, yeah. like I think they use web containers is a technology they use for you know all this work. And again, it uses WebAssembly and all those things to make it happen. No, it's a it's a really fun space. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, but I spend my time working on a browser-based ID at Google. And so for me, like, this is like I didn't. pretty much like the thing I spend all my day, like thinking about figuring out like how to make it faster. Where do we draw the line between abstracting with the details versus just giving them a full environment? You know, in our case though, we give you a full VM so you can still run all your terminal commands. You have legacy support for all the things you might want to do, but pros and cons to all these approaches. So, you know, I think there's a, it's a rich, ecosystem there that's going to be built around figuring out what is the best way to take what's running natively on your local dev environment and just have it run in anywhere. You know, you can get a Chromebook or an iPad and just have it work. And that's an exciting space, which is partly why I spent so much of my of my daytime figuring out working with my team on how to pull this off. How does so how does what you're working on compare to like GitHub uh, code spaces? Is is this like I don't even know? Is this a, a internal Google thing? Is this an external? Uh, it's external. You know, it's currently in a wait list, but you can try it out. You know, we process you very quickly. The yeah. biggest yeah. difference is that you know I'll, say, I'll talk about similarities because yeah. VS Code is probably the most popular IDE that people use outside of like very specialized ones for like let's say Xcode or Android Studio and things like that. We wanted to make sure that we built on top of. VS Code. So we're using Code OSS, which is the official open source version of Visual Studio Code. And so our product is built, it's called IDX, you know, letter ID, letter I, letter D, letter X. And so we're built on top of Code OSS, which means that all your familiarity of your, you know, if your projects work in VS Code, it's going to work in our environment. And a lot of the extensions are available through the open VSX marketplace. So your V6 files will all be available. So we know one of the number one is like minimizing the friction it'll normally take for you to go from like, I have everything set up. I'm familiar with this environment to, I want to try something new. So minimizing some of that. And the bigger difference I think what we provide is we are trying to, you know, we like, there are multiple terms like to use. One of the things we like to call it called batteries included. So if you're starting a project, if you, we give you a variety of starting points pre-configured for whatever you're trying to do, whether it is a web app, we support all the various templates you might see. And it's very similar to what you might see with Stacklets, for example, you can create like an app across all these front end and back end frameworks. We also are big into the mobile development space. So if you, want to have like an Android emulator, for example, that gives you like a real, like an actual more 
accurate representation of what your app looks like, we give you all those capabilities out of the box with any configuring all runs in a VM again. So building a Flutter app or in, even a web app, we're going to preview it on an Android emulator. We give you all that out of the box, which means that you can be in a low-end device. You can even be on like, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter posting screenshots of them on their little Android tablets now doing full-scale back-end front-end development using what we're building all from just their browser. And so our goal really is like, you know, if we say that it's a commodity now to have a dev environment running in your browser, what can we do to add more value to it? And that really is the the friction, the, just the complexity of like figuring out what frameworks to install, like what, how to configure my build machine. Like for example, if you're building a Rust app, the amount of CLI tools you need to install to configure to go from like, you know, writing in C++ to now having it output be a CLI tool, that's probably way too much for someone to figure out. And so we want to kind of pre-configure the environments for all these things. So one can imagine, you know, which we might do is like, for example, WebAssembly and WebGPU and all these other cool things that are coming out. Can we create an environment so you don't have to worry about like, do I use CLang or do I use, you know, any other kind of compilation tool and give that approach. And of course, because we're built on top of VS Code, if you have a GitHub repo of existing projects, that integration just works really, really nicely. So it's really about simplifying the, the world of development from a professional developer point of view. But the, you know, the last part I think is really big is the whole artificial intelligence space. You know, Google's been investing very heavily, of course, in, in AI for code completion and code generation. And so we want to make sure that is front and center in everything that we do. And look at the long term, right, the way I look at it, and this actually really touches upon Zilch and Flash and all these things, is I think we've taken a wrong turn in development like 20 years ago when we went from like, you know, development is something that anybody can now, you know, do great things with to you now need to be, a, you know, what's traditionally known as a, like a developer to be able to do this. Like you need to understand projects and build files and, you know, JSON blobs and all these things before even Hello World gets put up on the screen. And the center of gravity hit it so hard to that audience that we have been seeing like really complicated frameworks and tools coming out for the past, you know, 10, 15 years that almost make development not fun anymore. Like, you know, the things that probably got you interested in programming many years ago, the things that got me interested in programming many years ago, if I had to start over today, I would first be lost because I'd be advertised by like 20 different products saying like, you know, use our tool. And I would not have any idea of taking that and actually sharing it with people. You know, there's no GeoCities like equivalent or like things like that. It's like, sure, I'm using this serverless solution. I'm like publishing GitHub pages, but I don't know what exactly is going on behind the scenes. So when I have to go like, okay, I need to deploy to like Netlify or Cloudflare, or Google Cloud or Azure, AWS. I have no idea what I'm doing because it's all just like proprietary compartmentalized deployment capabilities that are all like, you know, very much like a, yeah, basically subscribe to this vendor. I know and you learned that vendor's secret handshake on how to make this work. It's not applicable anywhere else. And so I think AI is going to kind of help normalize a lot of these things. You know, my goal always is that I want to, you know, we're starting with professional developers right now, but with AI, we can meld the worlds of pro code, low code, and no code, where if all you want is I have a problem and I need to have this working, I have an inventory, an Excel file of the various inventory things that I need to put on my phone so my people and my team have access to very quickly, I should be able to do that without having to know about what dev tool should I use? What language or framework should I do it? Is it going to be server-side rendered? Is it going to be client-side? Like, no, those are all implementation details. Unless you care about it, you should never have to worry about that. And so in many ways, I think the democratization of development back to it's just a set of tools to help solve a problem, I think that's where I really want to get back into because I feel like what we've got to now is that the tools themselves are seen as the end as a solution. It's like, no, no one wakes up every day saying, I want to spend eight hours writing code or I want to spend 10 hours spending time with like, you know, fiddling with like settings in my, my dev tool. It's like, I just want to solve this problem so I can get out of my day, get out of my job. And so I think AI is going to be the big one there. And so for me, all my time really is spent on like, okay, what can we do now to make sure developers today are productive with the long-term goal, of course, of like, and, and long-term here is like, given how fast AI is moving, could just be six months from now for all we know. Like, you know, I'm like, might be years away, might be six months from now. And, and, and that's really where I'm like hedging so much of my attention on is that, you know, I want artificial intelligence to make it so that we're spending more time doing things we care about unless on like, you know, why is my version of React, you know, not compatible with the version of React router that I'm using behind the scenes to make this work? And I don't want to learn Next.js right now because that's going to require me to rewrite my old code base. And so those are the things that developers face day in and day out of real problems. 
And I don't think we're solving that. You know, we're just trying to replicate it by creating more problems on top of the problems, hoping that's going to solve it. Yeah, but arguing about the linter rules is so fun sometimes. <laughs> I, I mean, it can no, I, be. I totally agree with you. I, I yeah, it's in like this respect uh, like the, the cut common like you know the drama from like you know back then we talked about like is it object oriented programming? Is it like you know C plus plus? Now it's like is it tailwind? Do I not use tailwind? I'm like use yeah. whatever, just use whatever works. I I'm I am not going to be like the arbitrator of any of this. So I um so I mentioned earlier I'm here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right, very close to the University of Michigan, and I have tons of friends who are, you know, working on PhDs and everything like that, and all of them are like, oh, like now I got to learn programming to like munge all this data, and they're you know they're just they got to you know it's this whole you know setup and it's and it's difficult and everything, and and some of them get more into it than others, but they're just trying to like you know, analyze this data in, in a better way. Like, it, what, what you're talking about is like, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> people would really appreciate that in so many, in so many contexts. Yeah, I think AI even today might be able to help them out greatly because I've seen so many posts from people either using like ChatGPT or Gemini where they take a screenshot of like a table of like just data and they're like, you know, put this into a form that like, you know, makes sense to me or like sum up all the values of the column. It's able to process that visual information, turn it into like actual tabular data and do all of this work. And I can always imagine if you have data in a form of like, here's a spreadsheet and here's a like columns and cells and you paste it in, it might even give you the code and say like, you know, give me the code if I'm using like the, like I think like a common thing is like, like Jupyter notebooks or like this is AI notebooks in general. I think there's so much pop opportunity here for them to like, you know, well, as much as I'd love for them to learn like Python or something to like do it themselves, they could get by I think today with just using AI to solve so much of it for them. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So getting back to, you know, so you went to college, you know, did you major in computer science? I did. Yeah. So what, you know, cause there's always a line between like, I enjoyed programming. I like doing stuff, you know, cause you learned in high school, like, you know, you learned, started with flash and did APCS and so on to actually making a leap and going like, you know what, this is what I want to make my career and probably like, you know, large productive parts of my life about. So what was that jump for you? Like, when did you realize like, this is it, this is what I want to. Ah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, it was something that I always um, just really enjoyed. I mean, I had these, like, when I started off um, college, I had these thoughts, like, maybe I'll do, like, something, you know, you know, something else. But, uh, uh, but it became very clear, you know, very quick to me that uh, I, uh, I, I love the programming Fortunately for me, and, and this, you know, so I mean, my story might have been different had a few things changed, right? If I hadn't had that, um, you know, some of if my first intro to coding had been like my university's um, introductory computer science class, which I think at the time it was like some like CLI based, like, you know, you know, C++ like pizza ordering, you know, a program. I, I knew a bunch of, of folks who took that and, and like dropped out and stuff. It wasn't um, uh, very exciting. Um, uh, yeah. So anyhow, so I, but I had this um, uh, ability, uh, well, no, ability is the wrong word, opportunity to engage um, with the tech in a really fun way. Because I'll be honest, like, the, a lot of my intro CS classes didn't inspire me a lot, but the university that I went to um, had this really good thing where they give a lot of, of jobs to students. Um, so I worked my in, entire time in university, not getting paid very much money, but, you know, getting paid and getting real experience doing solving real problems with code and, um, uh, I think that was was a big thing um, that that pulled me along in in the right direction, or, or it, maybe the right direction is not the right right word, but in the direction that I went um, to follow with with computer science and stuff. Yeah, I mean that's actually fantastic. It's one of those things you never realize unless you look back at like the small things that could have gone differently that would change the path of your career in a massive amount of way. Like if you just didn't have that kind of a class or the opportunity to kind of figure out like, you know, I can make a living doing this or I'm the other way around. It's like, you know, I have a job doing this and that's part of doing it. You're like, I actually like this a lot. I'm going to go further into it. So much of it is like, I think for anybody who's doing anything for like a long period of time, it's always one of those moments, you know, it's like, I guess it's different from like, 
maybe the 1800s where like, you know, your family was farmer. So you're like, yeah, naturally I'm going to farming profession or like blacksmithing or like, you know, whatever that was, it's kind of like, you just know what you're going to be doing. I think for a lot of us, I guess last hundred years or so, it's like, yeah, uh, what, you know, what my families might've done may no longer be the thing that is like the thing that, you know, I have to do because there are just so many more things that can be done with like minor adjustments to hobbies and interests and, and practice. So no, that's actually really cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was a fun it was a fun intro it, to get into it. So yeah, and, and so from there, you know, you you worked at companies, you you know, worked on projects and things like that, and then you made a leap to entrepreneurship. So what was the what was the you know, the point? I, I, I don't want to say breaking point because for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's like it's like that's it. I'm done with like all the corporate, you know the complications and organizational bureaucracy and just the challenges of it. For others, it's more like, okay, I learned a lot of great skills and now I want to like try to see if I can do things on my own at scale quicker and faster in a direction that my company does not really do. So I'm not going to, I don't want you to answer like why you left corporate life to do some of these things. But, you know, I'm always curious to know though, like what was the jump like, you know, because on one hand it's like you have stability, you have the, you know, you know exactly what you're doing as part of your day job when you're working at a large corporation or, you know, any tech you know, environment and then you're going at your own which is almost like you know it's not even a case we talked about earlier where you're jumping into the deep end without stairs in this case like you don't even know where you're jumping into it's like basically you just have a rough idea of the destination and then everything else you're defining along the way yeah it's hard <laughs> it's um yeah it, it it is it is difficult and more difficult than than i thought uh it it would be um it's interesting like so my um getting into the world of entrepreneurship has been less about me wanting to like just you know start my own company one day or like you know be a, a ceo or whatever and and more about this side project that I had been working on for some time uh, called Zilch that um, friends thought was pretty cool and I loved tinkering with and I was like I'd like to 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 see if I can build this into to something bigger because I love I love building the other aspects of entrepreneurship I am very much a novice at and I and I have a lot of uh, uh, painful growing to <laughs> to go through. Um, uh, but, you know, for me, it was just like, I just want to see if I can, I, I can make something um, out of building, out of building this thing. Because this is so fun to build something, especially something that's very greenfield, right? I mean, as I'm sure any, you know, software engineer can, can relate to. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So how do you land upon this idea? So Zilch, you know, is a way for, if I do summarize it very quickly, it's kind of like, I want to learn development and coding, but I want to learn it in a more friendly, fun way. And so I get thrown into like essentially a series of games and then I can add code to make it better, which in many ways describes how you guys started with programming and what clicked for you is like, I, you know, they had some things there. I wrote a little bit of code in realize coding, but now I'm able to do some of those things. So I can see so much of your history of like what got you started with programming represented in everything that Zilch is trying to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, so the the story of kind of how this got started was, I think I may be, may be mistaken on the exact year. I think it was 2017. It was over um, Thanksgiving and uh, we were with my wife's family and my brother-in-law uh, was taking a machine learning class in in college and wanted to try out some concepts um uh, from that class so we got to chatting and we decided to code together super quick a little um connect for uh user interface and uh what we did is it, we had for player one and for player two it was two just input boxes pointing it at a url so i coded up a little node.js server he coded up a little python server and uh, the game just had a, a, a format, an API for, you know, exactly what the uh, responses were expected. And it gave the state of, of, of the game. And from there, we were able to code up two bots to play each other uh, in Connect4. And it was a pretty quick thing to, to get up and running, you know, took just uh, uh, two, 
just took a few hours. I made a simple rules based, like if it's three in a row, like block them or like go in the spot. And then he used this, some of these fancy like neural network concepts that he was uh, learning uh, in his class. And it was just a, such a fun way um, to, uh, to engage together and to write some code together and to, um, and to engage with new, like new ideas uh, uh, at the same time. So that's sort of the genesis um, of Zilch. And I'm the type of guy that I just, I always have a side project, right? I just, I have a hard time not having a side project. Um, and so this sort of developed gradually into my main uh, side project that I was just, you know, tinkering with when I had time in, in the evenings and on weekends and stuff. And uh, having folks that I know try it out. And, and from there, it, I was like, okay, like this, I feel like this has, this has some potential. Or I, I can see how this is adding some value to people's lives in the world. Maybe there's an opportunity to, to spend more time doing this. So, when did you decide to go from it being a side project to realizing there's more to this? I'm going to make this my full-time activity. Well, I, I think it was, so I, I um, joined Microsoft in, in the middle of the pandemic and uh, I hadn't worked for a big uh, tech company before and uh, just worked at startups um, before. And, and for those who don't know, there's, there's typically, I mean, not always, but typically a, 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 a decent pay difference between, you know, startups and, and, and big tech. And I, we, did, we ended up, didn't change our standard of life. And all of a sudden we were just, you know, accumulating more like money in our bank account. And it's like, well, we could go buy a bigger house or a fancy car or something. None of that stuff just felt super <laughs> exciting to me. And I was like, well, maybe could give, give ourselves a little bit of runway and, and, and try to make this happen. So it started uh, kind of coming together um, um, in that time at Microsoft and we're like, okay, let, let's do it. And I'm talking, we, that's, that's me, me and my wife, because obviously she was a big, <laughs> a big factor in, in, in the decision, in the decision too. But I think when she saw folks being excited about it, it was like, okay, this is, this is something worthwhile um, to spend some time on. And I think also, uh, um, you know, I had, I had like a lot of chats with, with people because I know the statistics as, as well as, as anybody else. It's like, hey, you start out a new venture, like a startup, something like this. Like, it's very hard to bring something to a place where uh, it's, it's viable and it's, it, it's profitable and you can make a living and uh, uh, create a, a, you know, a company, an organization from that. Um, and but I just thought, well, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is, you know, spend a year or two working on something like this. And if it all uh, crashes and burns, I will have learned a ton and have had a really good time and be able to, to move on to somewhere else. So I kind of like realized it's like, well, that's, that's the worst case scenario. That is not that bad. I should just do it. I should just go for it. Um, and I tell you what, I have learned a lot and I have made a lot of mistakes <laughs> in this process. So it has been a super instructive, um, uh, process jumping into this, into this world of, of entrepreneurship. Um, and so we'll see how, we'll see how it turns out, but it, it has been a ton of fun. So I, I think you have the right frame of mind on how to approach entrepreneurship and startups and things like that. So let's go back to, so you quit your job at Microsoft. Now this is day one of you now working full time on Silch. What did you do on day one? Okay. So on, <laughs> so I had had a, a sort of a mostly functional prototype um, that was uh, an electron just desktop app that integrated with like Docker on people's machines uh, and stuff to like spin up like these different uh, dev environments. And I had been like testing that out with um, uh, different uh, different folks and having people give me feedback on that. And, um, you know, one of the things that was very apparent was, okay, this is, this is great. 
but it's a little bit tough to get started with because someone new to coding, it's like, well, you need to install this application, which that's one thing, right? But then it's like, you also need to install Docker on your machine. And that, I mean, <laughs> people up, you know, like, <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, if I really want to, um, you know, help folks uh, level up their, their coding skills and, 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 I feel like a lot of folks that are really looking to level up their coding skills are are are, are towards um, the more beginner end of the skill spectrum that I need to make this easier to engage with. So, uh, day one was okay. Now I have time and 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 breathing room and space in my life to actually think about what what are some ways to make this um, this easier. And so, the web based approach, um, which uh, Zilch. Um, uh, uh, takes integrating with some existing tools is is what I went with. And what's really cool is that you can do pretty awesome stuff in the web browser nowadays with WebGL and different frameworks that abstract all the complicated stuff for you and um, create some compelling compelling visuals and things right in the web browser without even needing to um, uh, be outside of that environment. And it's also, also something that I'm familiar with just in terms of my career and what I've done uh, before as well. So yeah, so day one was like, okay, I'm going to like architect this new app. If I could go back to day one, I would change what I did. But they, that's what I did do <laughs> on day one. It was like, I know what I'm going to build and I'm going to, you know, build this whole thing after getting- What would you have changed if you had to go back in time? If I, if I had to go back in time, um, I, I had someone I, I explain to me- uh, uh, this not long ago. Hopefully, I don't do a, a I don't butcher the um, analogy. But when you're starting a new uh, company and you're looking to create something that really adds adds value uh, to the world, it's better to be pulled by demand rather than to push an idea. It's like a piece of string. Like if you push a piece of string, it's not going to have an effect on the, you know, the object that it's attached to. But if, but if that string is being pulled, then it will actually have a, an effect. Um, and so uh, going back to day one, I think that I thought that I was being pulled um, by some uh, interactions with very friendly audiences with friends and with family and with you know this you know group of individuals and was like they think it's useful they you know they you know they they think that this is a good idea but uh, going back to day one i would have engaged right away without making any code <laughs> and making any changes to my code or, or starting to develop a new thing right away engage with um, who I thought the actual users of this would be to make sure that I'm, you know, building something that is really lockstep with exactly what they need and have every decision be informed uh, by that. But, and that, I mean, that all sounds obvious enough, um, but, you know, I'm a software engineer my entire career and, you know, I just, you know, you get a little bit of feedback from people and you have, you know, great product managers and stuff, the vo you know, voice of the user, you know, in your team. And I just didn't have, um, and I'm still building the, this, the skill set to really um, engage, engage um, on that level. But boy, I have built a ton of empathy um, uh, since I've started working on Zilch for all of the different people throughout an organization that make that make the different aspects of of a company um, work from sales to marketing to um, just everything, right? It's it, it all of it um, are di are difficult jobs that require folks that have have a lot of skill. So, and I and I'm learning that more <laughs> firsthand right now. Yeah, it's always a fun thing. It's just a very common among startup founders is that when they do wear all these various hats they have a new perspective on like, why was that person telling me this like X number of years ago? Or why did that feedback go, you know, why would we not react to the customer feedback? At that time, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, 
disagree and commit and just do what I'm, you know, think it's right. But now you get a different perspective. It's like, oh, now it makes sense. It's like, I can see why that feedback, as loud as it was, was not the right thing for us to focus on or, you know, any discipline, sales, marketing, legal, and all these things, you kind of understand the constraints a little bit more. Yeah, no, yeah, you absolutely, absolutely do. Um, so it's um, big, big, big learning opportunities. And honestly, even that has been valuable um, um, to me just to, um, uh, uh, to step into that. Because there's some things that you can hear and you can learn about, right, in a, in a theoretical sense. But most things in life I've found in this and, you know, just a lot of categories of life, if you really want to understand something, you got to experience it and you got to be um, in the moment and, and have those experiences. And that's where growth happens. And it's yeah, a hard I think, to be in, but it's a good place to be in, I think. Exactly. I think like one of the more classic phrases, and I'm probably butchering it as well, is that, you know, you can read and watch as many videos about swimming as you can. But until you actually take the first step in the water, you won't actually know anything about what you've done. So all the theoretical knowledge kind of goes out the window when you get to feel like the, you know, the water and your toes and like you're actually, you know, hopefully floating, you know, as you dump into the, the pool. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. You kind of need to, you need to live it a little bit and be, and just, yeah, just allow yourself to be put in a position to fail. Because that's a yeah. scary place to be in, um, but it's where so much growth uh, happens. So, so you said like you realized that you know you want to be working on things that there's demand for, as opposed to trying to kind of force features and things that you think or you think are the right things people do. What what changed? Like when did you you know what made you realize that I'm focusing on the wrong set of things that I need to grow my business? And what was the first thing you did at that point? Was it kind of like stop where you're working on right now, reset your roadmap, or can you walk me through a little bit of that? Yeah, it was a slow realization over time, just building because um, I was so heads down coding, right? So heads down, like you know, building this and building that. And I would get like little bits of feedback and stuff from uh, uh, you know from folks, but just not uh, not from the right people. It's when I started speaking with. Um, uh, like high school teachers and and college professors that I started being like, oh, <laughs> I should have done this way earlier. <laughs> and 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 then um, there's a little bit of a delayed reaction, but then it was like, okay, I need to really talk to people and understand, um, you know, where they where they're coming from in in a better way. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, it's one of those things that when you realize it's like, seems so obvious, like you mentioned, right? It's like, of course, yeah. you know, it makes a lot of yeah, sense, but in that right? moment, it's always tricky yeah. to realize that, yeah, I'm happy driving on the road, but you're not realizing there's a parallel road you could be taking that could be a better one. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure like a year ago, former Braden um, could have given a more compelling answer about the choices that I made then, but today's version of Braden, having learned things, I just look back on that. I'm like, it looks so ridiculous. I have a hard time making it even sound um, um, uh, sensible just because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this so what sense. was the feedback that students and professors, I mean, college, I mean, high school teachers and students, gave, I mean, professors gave you that, you know, you're like, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. So, I mean, so one of the things, um, like in a conversation that I had with um, a a, a professor was he's like yeah this is great and this is cool and everything but his problem as a professor like what he's trying to solve even though like he's teaching these classes is isn't necessarily teaching the students which right in theory it should be but it's like he's doing a lot of research right and he's super strapped for time and he's like I think that this is cool. And, but like all of his thoughts were focused on, I wonder if there's some way to add like automatic grading of solutions to this and things that would be time savers for him in his line of work, which of course I, you know, I didn't think about any of that, you know, and I'm not, you know, entirely sure if, if, 
you know, that's what I like want to branch into or not, but like, it would have been so good to get some of that stuff um, up front. And even things like just simple things from like high school teachers being like our district, um, cause I built it with GitHub integration. It says how most people have GitHub accounts and it makes a lot of things just a little bit easier to, uh, to get started and it's somewhere to like put the code where they don't, you know, don't have to think about what, where is this on my machine? But they're like, um, yeah, a lot of districts, not all districts, but a lot of districts are like school districts, uh, like, uh, the kid, you know, we, we don't let our students sign up for GitHub accounts yet, you know, using their, their school email as like a required part of class and, and things like that, which, you know, right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so there's some, you know, some fundamental things like that, where it's like a lot of development work and just validated, uh, some things with, um, the wrong, uh, the wrong audiences, um, and that's another thing too. It's like who who is this being um, uh, built built for? Which I've waffled on as well. Haven't had a, a laser a vision of of that because when I first started building it, when I, I mentioned earlier, it's like okay, you need to have Docker on your machine and all these and all these things. I was like, well, I know someone brand new to coding isn't going to be able to do this, but it was a nice way to be able to get a development environment you know, set up quickly with the language that you didn't understand, um, which is valuable, um, you know, but so, so I was kind of coming from that place of like, well, you know, maybe folks would need to have a little bit more experience um, to get started. And so these not super well-defined assumptions about exactly who, um, you know, are the folks that are going to benefit from this rather than this just broad, like, oh, like folks that want to level up their coding skills could be folks at the beginning, could be folks further, you know, further along, like there's, right, you know, so that, uh, that's an opportunity. So I hope anybody like listening to this that has, you know, entrepreneurial thoughts themselves is able to, um, that, you know, to internalize a, a little bit of <laughs> these things, because it is hard to, I feel like it's hard to get it a hundred percent, um, in, in, until you're really in it, but really just starting hundred percent from the, the demand side of, of the equation, not the idea side of, of the equation to be successful, at least in this space. But, you know, there's, you know, it, it it's a, um, I don't know. It's a bit of a, a, a bit of a catch 22 because this started just as a side project, not as a, like, Oh, I want to go find a problem, you know, that people have so I can, you know, start a company. It's just like a fun, a fun side project, but really converting that into, into something that's sustainable, um, I think requires a, a definitely a different mindset. Are you ever worried that the, that the excitement that got you started in this first place is like, Oh, I, I personally emphasize, emphasize this problem. So I want to spend all my time doing this starts going very counter to where you see the demand coming from, which is very different from like what you might've had in your mind. Were yes. you ever worried that might make this less fun, less exciting than it was a year or so ago when you started? Yes. Yes, I, absolutely. And I've spoken with some founders um, in this space that have done sim similar things. Um, and uh, they've said things like, yeah, we tried this and it didn't work out all the money, if you want to make this sustainable is in, is going to be in like recruiting and talent acquisition and, and, and things like that. It, there is, you know, the, you know, the education is just like, it's a little bit harder to, to really break into that. Um, but recruiting talent acquisition could be like a better fit for, you know, some of the things um, uh, that you're doing. And I'm like, I don't really like, I mean, I recognize that things like that add value to the world, but I don't have like a huge burning desire in, in my heart to go solve the problems of, of, of recruiters and people interviewing like, like new developers on teams. And, and there would be required a different like product outlook and, you know, some you know, right substantial changes to it in order to make it really fit that. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely have that fear cause it's, it's like, do I, do I really want to do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's a, 
it's a common one. I, I face it all the time as well. My side projects are like blogging and things that I'm like, people want to learn about Rust, but I don't want to learn about Rust and write about it. I want to focus on web development and creative coding and things like that. And it's a tension, you know, at, at some point it becomes a, a labor of love. We just enjoy doing it. And it's a, always a question of like, is it a business? Is it a passion project? Or can I somehow combine them both where I don't dilute either one of those important parts of the equation? So tell me about um, Karupa.com a little bit, just the history of it, how it got started, where you've had thoughts of entrepreneurial mindset with regards to it and everything. I'd be curious to learn. Yeah, no, it got started purely as a as a hobby. I had no idea that it was going to be a thing in most ways. I started playing with Flash and I started creating some stuff for fun and I posted on GeoCities. You know, I think it had like a whopping one megabyte of free space, which was just enough to put like a few, you know, Swift files up there with like an index HTML file. And I think it's like, I was so new. I had no idea what I was really doing, right? And Half the time, I'd just be uploading my Swift files, and I didn't realize that my HTML file needed to be renamed something different than whatever it needed to be. So I'd just be overwriting the old HTML files every single time it upload. So only the most recent Flash file that was uploaded would be, re- would be like referenced in the in the markup itself. Like I, that's how primitive my understanding was of how everything worked. Right. And so that kind of got me thinking more about like, okay, let me learn more about this. Let me learn like how to do some of these various things and so on. And that started getting some traction amongst people, especially in my, my friends. And they were like, oh, how do you create this? Like, you know, how did it make this all work? And so, so I spent time like writing small emails and like emailing people. I was like, oh, here's how I built this and things like that. And as it turned out, that wasn't very scalable. I couldn't email people over and over again, nor could I, you know, basically say like, oh, I replied to this a couple of weeks ago. Just go and check this out. This is, I'm sure news groups were probably around at the time. I had no idea what they were like. I, I feel like Gopher and like all those other services might've been those kind of things. I didn't, or Usenet, you know, those sort of things, like, I, I didn't know what they were. And so, like, yeah. let me just go ahead and write this and put this in, like, an HTML file and, like, put it on the web itself. So that way I can just point them to it directly. And so at that time, both Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer came with free versions of web editors. I think Netscape Composer was a Netscape version of it. Front Page Express was the version that came with, you know, the Internet Explorer browsers. So I used that to just copy and paste, like, you know, my email things and share it with people. And... Doing that, I learned about like, you no, know, what's a, what's an, what's a link? You know, how do you link from page to page? So I don't have to like have people in email like see five links. I actually have the links be there directly, and yeah. and that slowly you know steered create this effect where I'm like, okay, people are asking me questions, I'm answering it, it's getting a lot of popularity, and I created my first forums at the time as well because I couldn't handle the questions and support on my own. And at that time, Easyboard was a solution there. It was like basically what we would call a B two B SAS service, you know, you basically sign up for your name, you get like this weird URL, but you could basically create categories and have people post forms and, and questions and things like that without any worrying about like, how do I host it? How do I deal with all that stuff? Right. So this was probably like early 2000s, like 2001, 2002, essentially at the time. And that became really popular. And I think it's popular in many ways, mostly because there wasn't anything else out there like it. You know, there was at that time Flash Kit was, you know, it's around Ultrashock was around and, and a lot of my time, of course, to back up a bit, what I wrote about was, of course, Flash and ActionScript and how to make things work in that environment. So that's why I was referring to like, you know, Flash Kit and Ultrashock and all these others. And, and so it's like fun to be very early in a space where I don't know if they, you know, I talked to like some of the people who were worked at Ultrashock and also on Flash Kit, you know, even now I keep in touch with them to see like, hey, how's it going? You know, what's, what are you working on and so on. And they all had a good idea of what they were doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like creating forums. I'm like, I spent probably a couple of weeks finding the perfect like pixel avatars to get people to pick, you know, choose where it was like, they were all like working on really serious problems. But the thing is that the things that I was filling with were things that I personally thought was exciting, which happened to resonate with a lot of people my age, you know, who are like, you know, 12, 13 and 14 were like, oh, this is really cool. I get to like have this like Counter-Strike icon set I can use for basically asking my question. And so that was the hook that I had that separated me from what made Ultrashock and Flash get, you know, the place where more serious professional designers and developers congregated at. Whereas mine was more of like, just, you know, kind of the new grounds and like the, the deviant art kind of a crowd were focusing more on development. It was like, oh yeah, this is cool. Like you know, there's a pixel art going on here. And and I don't know why there's music playing in the background, but I dig it, you know? So everything you shouldn't do, 
I did, but I didn't know any better. And that was what actually made it catch on. And so through that, you know, it became really popular and then the forums became really big and it just became a nice side project. You know, I never wanted to make it a my actual full-time thing, partly because for a long time, a site was actually, you know, like I had ads, it was really you know, monetizable. It was actually great to, you know, see that part of the business and all these things through, but I really didn't enjoy it as much. And I also really got lucky in many ways in that I really like dev tools and design tools, like, you know, Macromedia and things like that. And so I actually stumbled upon being a product manager at Microsoft, working on the uh, uh, basically the first version of what would become one of their design tools that, you know, they worked on called the Expression product line. And that was a lot of fun where I could realize I could like, actually combine my passion for tooling and design into what ultimately became a career. And so I didn't want to give that up because I enjoyed the challenges too much. I enjoyed the people I worked with. I enjoyed the, the things I was working on. And as a product manager, I got to work on multiple different things at the same time. So I didn't, I was never like pigeonholed into like doing one thing for a long time where I got bored. And so I always had this tension between like, do I work on my side project, which is also profitable, you know, full time? Do I continue working at Microsoft and then doing this thing full time? And that tension played out for quite some time, actually, where I, you know, did my work at Microsoft, work on different products and really enjoyed being a product manager. In parallel, I, you know, was doing a lot of the work on the side on the website. I started writing books. I started taking my content, putting to video form. And at some point, you know, like it was probably like mid 2000. 10, 2012, essentially, you know, I was like talking to my wife. I was like, you know what? I've been at Microsoft now for almost like, you know, like seven, eight years now. Let me just take a break and see if I want to make this, you know, my crew.com work, actually do it full time. And so I did I actually quit Microsoft and I decided to do it full time for a bit. And what I realized is I hated every minute of it. You know, like, like I, the reason I asked you about like, what was your day one like when you did like, you know, when you quit your job and you started working on the same thing? Because I still remember my day one. I was like, great, I have all these things I want to do. At that time, Trello was the big task tracking tool. I want to put all the things I want to do in Trello. And then I went to a Starbucks and I just started like, you know, working on all these things. And and my thing was like, I wanted to basically write write books essentially because I really enjoyed that world of it. And, you know, the, right, the way I write books is that all the content in my book is available for free on the website, but the book is convenient. So I'm still writing content for the website. And now I have a way of like recording videos about it and putting it in a book form. So it goes into, you know, schools and libraries and things like that. I always enjoyed like, you know, this is probably a very selfish way of looking at it, but I love when people email me from like various parts of the world saying like, hey, I was in my school library and I saw this book. And probably like a five-year-old book I wrote, right? And they're like, but it got so cool. I learned about how to do it. I'm like, I'm like, that is why I do this. You know, it's like, it's not because like I want people to go to google.com and be like doing these things. It's like, you no, know, there are so many places in the world where the way people learn is the way we learned like a while ago, which is like you go to like a bookstore or you go to like you know, your school library, you find this like, you know, tattered book that happens to have this material. And you learn from that. And, and that's why I always was like, this is why I do this is because I want to take all my content, put it into a form that can go into all these parts of the world that I would never be able to get to myself. Like, you know, self-publishing via Amazon, for example, doesn't help in that because it requires someone to know and buy and then ship it. And most libraries will not take content from Amazon for quality reasons. And so, you know, the hassle of like the publishers and so on was worth it because I was reaching an audience I could never get to doing that. Now, the problem was, you know, so during that time, like, you know, I think I, I took about a year off to work on this. I wrote about three books and I still update edition of this book right now. So I loved all part of that. But what I absolutely hated was a lack of social interaction with people around me. Because like so much of like the, the things that I did, the people I spoke to and worked with and so on were colleagues from work. Most of my friends were colleagues from work, especially just like went to Microsoft from college. So all my friends in the age group was one where you're like more amenable, just meeting people and like, you know, all of these things. And I realized when I was working on my own, there really wasn't that outlet for me to have these kind of creative conversations. And so that's when I was like, you know what? I'm not cut out to be a, a solo entrepreneur. And I don't want to hire people and do all these things because that adds an extra level of pressure where now it can't be like, oh, let me just try this random thing and see if it works or not. Because now I'm actually dependent on someone else's livelihood to make this all work. Because the same things I did back then where I'm like, I'm going to spend time on pixel art and do all these things. I still think it's a very fun thing of what I want to do even now. I'm like, you know, I need to maintain that level of balance where, you know, if I do what everyone else is doing, I'm never going to be successful. So just do something quirky that I find interesting. And if 10 people find that equally interesting as well, then I've managed to do something successful in my view of what that means. And so that definitely means I can't be, 
you know, how other people depend on my random whims on like what needs to be done or not done and, and things like that. And so, and so, you know, after my three books were, you know, pretty much done, you know, then the, my commitment again is like volunteers. Like I can write whenever I want. I can publish videos whenever I want and so on. I went back to Microsoft, you know, and this time I took kind of a more complicated project in the same web space, you know, in all these areas. And, and ever since then, I've been kind of content that I tried this out, you know, and I wasn't cut out for it. It just wasn't my thing, but I still get the benefit of still doing side projects, still publishing books and videos, having conversations with people like you, for example, and also doing the thing at, you know, at whatever day job I'm in, you know, right now, as I mentioned, I'm at Google working on dev tools and like bring a brand new product that kind of, in my view, should simplify how people build apps in the future. And so I get to scratch all these multiple itches. And so, yeah, very lucky to have, you know, like going back to like small decisions you make that are going to change the course of your life greatly. It just so happens that, you know, I'm a big believer that luck plays a big role in like, you know, so much of what we do in our career. It just so happened that I had this really weird hobby of developer tools and design tools that ended up becoming a very hot part of the tech sector over the past, you know, 20 years. You know, if you no one 20 years ago, I said like, yeah, you can build a career working on developer tools. And it's mostly a place where you go to because you're like, yeah, you know, I just enjoy coasting essentially. It's like what you do, you know, especially honestly, if you're at Adobe or Autodesk or some of these companies were known for building developer tools, right? At that time, Microsoft built Visual Studio. That product was Visual Studio. It's been around for a while. It's not going to go anywhere. And so you just go and work on, you know, improving the, moving the needle from like, you know, one small degree to another degree. And so being able to do something brand new there, which I never thought I would be able to do, happened to be the right place at the right time. And then continuing that across and then having the same thing to do at Google where right place, right time, right ideas is, you know, one of the things where I can't predict that. And if it didn't happen, I don't know what I'd be doing instead. But all of these experiences though kind of like collide into making it, you know, I do also believe you can gamify your luck as well. And so the, you know, being persistent, being good at what you do, trying to be a good team player, all these things, there's a crew value. And so when the opportunity arises, you can kind of do some of these things as well. And so, and so that's kind of like how my personal side projects and my professional job all collided into this one big circle where I don't really know where one ends and the other one begins. But I'm happy because that kind of goes back to the question I asked you earlier. At what point does your passion for something and your work diverge to the point where it's no longer fun? Luckily for me, they've never diverged too far. They've all been in that same, like, you know, within that, within arm's reach where I still have fun doing what I'm doing. And that, you know, accrues value to my side projects, the things I learned in my side projects accrues value to my day job. And I'm a product manager. So getting better at communication, getting better at writing, getting better at all these things is a core part of what I do anyway. And so I feel like I'm optimizing everything I'm doing into just just having fun at the same time. I think you can add a lot of value to the world when you're having fun. Because I believe so, you know, because it makes all the drudge work and the drudgery just so, so much more tolerable. It's like, yeah, I get it. But, you know, this is the part I need to do to have more fun later on. Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you've, you've had fun over the years, because I think we talked about it a little bit before uh, you press record, but I've per personally found value from like the things that you did. So which was so cool that we're able to um, uh, connect when I first got into when I first got into Flash and, and reading. Yeah, it. no, I, I'm glad to hear that. And, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, like, you know, the age group of when you were interested in that and the age group I was when I was interested in like doing all this stuff fully synced up, which is, I think that was my target audience really is like people who were at that stage of their life who are doing things in school or like in college where, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm open to trying out like, you know, what does like making these circles move randomly accomplish? I have no idea, but it is fun though. So I'm going to learn it anyway. Whereas like the other sites were teaching and like, here, how do you get an MP3 player? How to load data from a database? And like, I'm like, that's boring. I get it. I know it's popular. I'm not going to do that. Though. I'm going to do like, you know, how do you create a random like a flash photo gallery, except the images are load randomly, not in sequence, you know? So I was like taking a, taking a different path, but that's the thing I'm also realizing more and more of as well, especially when I look around, it's like so much of like, when we look at like web design and development has been compartmentalized. It's like, it must look like this template design. It must look like this kind of a world where it kind of the creativity and the, and the bizarreness that made it so much fun, like let's say 20, 30 years ago, is just no longer there. And that's something, you know, in, in a lot of my talks, I talk to other designers and developers. I spent at least a few seconds like ranting about it a little bit because I'm like, you know, the, it was to be so much more fun back then. And we've gotten to this point where, Everything needs to be done in a way that the Twitter algorithm 
will boost it for you. The LinkedIn algorithm will boost it for you. The Facebook algorithm will boost it for you. Or YouTube, for example, which means the thumbnail needs to be in this format. The link to this video needs to be in this format. Because if it's not, no one's going to see it, which is very different than what it was back then. Because back then, you decided whether you liked it or not. It's like, oh, I like this video. Great, I'm going to watch it. It wasn't something that had to follow a predetermined pattern. And so those are the kind of things that always, like, at the back of my mind, I'm like, there has to be a better way. But I can't fight the very system that is driving traffic to the content that I'm actually creating. And so that creates this like weird, you know, incentive structure. Where I'm just like, I know I'm not doing the right thing here. Like I don't want I don't want to create a video of this format or a template that looks like this. But if I don't do this, I'm basically just talking to myself at that point. Which I guess is is why it's important that you have the intrinsic the intrinsic sort of motivation and desire of just finding value in the thing itself. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, using it as a way to just get better at any of the skills you've been trying to get better at. Like, you know, as a startup founder, you probably now learn more about marketing and how to, you know, structure a landing page, you know, call to actions and how to do like developer relations, all these things, which you may never have had to do before. So, you know, whatever happens, those skills will stay with you forever, you know, no matter what happens here. Yeah, yeah, and it's good to be the, to be uncomfortable to get into things like that. But there is, but no, I just love what you're saying. It's, it's, it's there is this component of fun that I think um, has the capacity to like change people's lives in like really meaningful ways that are about more than just fun. Because I mean, if I hadn't, you know, like fun was my entry into software development, which gives me, you know, the means to, uh, you know, provide for my family and, you know, do, you know, so many good things and, and you know, the f freedom and, and the, you know, lack of stress. I mean, there's so many like just healthy and like good, like uh, good things like right for society. So I, I, there is, there is, uh, there's a lot of value to just capturing people's imagination with that fun to, to get into a, a sort of space where you can actually, um, you know, add a lot of value to to your life and, and to society by engaging with that. Yeah. Speaking of fun, are you also a designer for everything you see on Zilch? Yeah, I, I am. There are some um, assets on there um, that are uh, like Creative Commons like some of the 3D stuff, like I didn't build the chessboard. I did design the tic-tac-toe one by hand though in Blender. That was fun to learn the 3D modeling, but. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And also the logo, was it you who designed it? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've always had kind of a foot in the, the design and a foot in the uh, development naturally. And it's, it's- Yeah, no, I, I, cause you know, I think I mentioned it before, I don't know if it's in the recording or not, but I love pixel art. And so like when I first saw this, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It, it blends like, you know, retro, like, you know, 8-bit gaming with like basically teaching you how to program, you know, by building some of these games. So that was like really fantastic. And so the avatar editor that you created you know, that's probably one of the most fun things I've ever seen where you actually have a grid where you can actually do what, what, what was basically the pixel art or sprite editor you might have had like back in the day, you provided for people to basically use to create their avatar. So that's actually, what was the story behind that? Cause that, that strikes me as like a, a fun, quirky thing that adds personality to what you're building. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly um, what, exactly the if there's much of a story behind wh how that came to be but i think it was is kind of like what we've been talking about it's like oh yeah that would be neat yeah definitely should have uh, a way to be able to uh, uh engage in you know bit, have these custom avatars to kind of give your bot that you're building like an identity and you know some personalization over it and being able to design the avatar that's just fun. <laughs> yeah. So are all the pixel bots you currently see on your home screen, were they all designed by you or would you like, do you like have a random procedural generator generate them for you automatically? Uh, so they're generated uh, uh, randomly. Most of the ones on there, there are a few of them that are like the zilch bot that has the, you know, the kind of set the design. And then the other ones are just, um, you know, generated randomly with the same generator that's used when people are creating their own bot, uh, in Zilch. Nice. And so last thing about Zilch bot, by the way, what was the inspiration behind the robot looking the way it does? 
looking um I don't know. Are you talking about like kind of like just the overall feel? Yeah, well, the whole shape of the robot because it's a very classic design. Because you know the reason I ask is like growing up, I loved playing the Mech Warrior and BattleTech games, mm -hmm. and that's a classic design for like the Vulture robots. You know where they actually could like you know they had lasers in their hands, but they also showed missiles from their shoulder pods, and it's probably like the best robot you could get. So I wasn't sure if you're trying to go for that, you know, kind of like that nostalgic factor for those of us who grew up playing that. We're like, wow, this is the Vulture. This is going to be amazing. So I didn't know. Um, I, I I am not familiar with that. So that is is not what I was going for. Um, what I went for is like it would be really cool if you could make the logo of Zilch like that Zilch bot using the same editor that anybody has access to to um, create you know avatars for uh, for their bots. So working within those constraints, I'm like, okay, I want it to be this many pixels by this many pixels. And I'm going to have to make the logo from this. And I just thought that that was a fun way to, to do it. So those were kind of the constraints that informed like how the logo would be made. Well, I, I think it's amazing, you know, so, but Brayden, it was great chatting with you and learning about how you went from working, you know, for a company to working for yourself and all the various things that are just the unknown that you've been navigating and basically creating this fantastic product around. So thanks again for taking the time to chat with me on this. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Krupa. I appreciate it.